No problem. No problem. Uh, next item on the uh, agenda is looking at additions or deletions to the addition, uh, agenda. Is there any that need to be made? Hearing no recommendation, I'd like to ask for uh, approval of the agenda. Do we have a motion? So Louis, thank you. Do we have a second? Robert, thank you. All those in favor, raise your right hand. The agenda has been uh, approved as presented. We have two sets of minutes that you received that we have to approve. The first, I ask that you take a look at the March 3rd minutes, and is there any recommendations, additions, deletions, corrections, et cetera, to the March 3rd meeting note, uh, notes? Hearing none, do we have a motion to accept the March 3rd minutes as presented? So moved. Thank you, Everett. Do we have a second? Patrick, thank you. Okay, all those in favor, raise your right hand. We also have the last set of minutes, and that's June 2nd, 2020 minutes. Are there any corrections, deletions, additions that need to be made? Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the June 2nd minutes as presented? Motion to Jonathan, thank you. Do we have a second? Robert, thank you. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Minutes are approved. Okay, next item on the agenda is item number six, CZ 2019-010 Orchard Creek. We're here tonight to either approve or deny the rezoning application that would go to the Board of Commissioners. So at this time, I'd like to call Lee up to the front to give a staff report on this. Sir, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're quite welcome. Um, if you'll recall, I, I'm not sure um, if everybody was here, but back in February, um, this rezoning request came before um, the, the, the planning board and you heard presentations from the applicant and you heard my staff report and you heard some, um, some neighbors um, that spoke. And the board um, tabled the, the request and asked the applicant to, um, to go back and address three um, three items or, or do some more background work on, on three really specific items. Uh, <clears throat> the first item was the pump station. Um, so this, this, the sewer from this uh, development will go either to the Stonebridge pump station or, or a new pump station to take it kind of a different way. But um, the board wanted some more information on that. I know the applicant has done that. They've worked through Public Works, had the system modeled and they have some answers for that. So I'll defer the pump station to the applicant to come up and talk about. Um, the second item the board wanted um, some clarification on was it was all really related to um, transportation and on street parking. Um, mainly, um, is on street parking, can it be accommodated with the cross sections and the right of way that were shown on the plans? Um, <clears throat> what were the cross sections that were going to be accommodated on, on in the project? And if that right of way changed from what was shown on the concept plan, how would that impact the total number of lots that the applicant was able to develop? And I want to defer to the applicant on that one as well. I think they have addressed that in their slideshow. Um, the third item that the board wanted clarification on, as you um, on the southern property here, um, there's a mobile home park with some existing residents in it. And, and the board was concerned about um, what rights um, those uh, folks that lived in the mobile home park had. Um, so I, I worked with um, our legal staff to try to come up with, with an answer. Um, so it's, it's really, it's more of a 30,000 foot answer because we don't, we don't have all the specific information about the content of what's in those um, rental agreements or, so we don't know those specifics. But um, from what our legal department has kind of told us is that 
they're, if they have w really whatever is in their rental agreement is what is 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 what controls. So, um, you know, if their rental agreement says that that they can stay there for X number of years, um, and there's no out clause, then they can do that. But I know a lot of rental agreements have certain types of of clauses where certain types of issues they can tell a tenant, yeah, I'm giving you 60 days notice or 30 days notice um, to move. Um, I don't, again, I don't know the specifics on, because the, each one of these people could have a completely different rental agreement or lease agreement. But that's the general rule is whatever's in that lease agreement is what the property owner is legally bound um, to do for those people. So if, if, if that lease agreement says you know, on 60 days notice, you have to vacate, then legally that's what they're required to do. Um, again, don't know the specifics of each individual person that lives in the mobile home park, but that's a kind of a 30,000 foot um, attempt at an answer for you on that one. Lee, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> How will we know if, if uh, they're gonna play by the rules, not just kick somebody the curb? Sure. Um, unfortunately, we, we won't. That's really something that if, if a tenant or a landlord breaks a lease agreement, then that's something that's handled through the North Carolina court system. Okay. All right. um, I, I am going to go through just really briefly. I know you have seen this before, but it's been a while, so just kind of want to run through the presentation um, real quick just so you kind of have an update. Um, again, this is uh, CZ 2019-010, Orchard Creek is the working title. Um, it is a rezoning request. Um, property is currently zoned RA40. Um, the applicant has requested a rezoning to R6 conditional, um, and that would allow a maximum of 296 houses to be built on the property. <clears throat> um, in addition to the, the homes, there's, there's some common area. This is a power line that runs through, so there's, some power, there's a common area there and somewhere around the ponds, um, an amenity center. Uh, there are two points of access onto Rocky River Road, and the density is about 2.6 um, dwelling units per acre. <clears throat> um, these are just some, some views. Um, the top left is looking um, from Rocky River Road into the property, um, same as the bottom. Um, bottom left, and these are just views up and down Rocky River Road. Um, these, I'll be honest with you, these are from Google Maps. Um, the times we went out to try to take pictures of the property, it was it was raining pretty hard, so we weren't able to get them. Um, th this is our municipality map, and I want to switch over here in just a second to our GIS, but um, in the vicinity of this map, you don't see any municipalities. This all shows um, unincorporated Union County. However, if you zoom out a little bit, this is the property. So those are the properties minus this piece across the road. But these are the properties and this kind of pink area here is the town of Mineral Springs. They're about three quarters of a mile away. So they're about three quarters of a mile west um, going down Highway 75, just to give you some little bit more zoomed out perspective. Um, <clears throat> the property to the north is, is mainly undeveloped. These, um, chicken, these are 2007 um, structure um, uh, shape files, so these don't exist anymore. They're gone. Um, but this property is is basically vacant. Um, the south property, again, um, it has the uh, the mobile home park currently on it. Um, zoning on this property is RA40. Um, property's been zoned RA40 um, since uh, the county established its zoning program um, back in the late 70s. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of environmental features that I'll point out. Uh, there's a fairly good sized pond um, kind of up toward the road and another one in the back. Um, the wetlands in the middle, I'll be honest with you, they likely don't exist anymore because that was in the location of the, um, 
of the uh, uh, chicken houses, and those have been torn down. So I, likely these wetlands aren't there. Um, and you've got a stream that runs through the property, um, kind of a, almost on the border. Um, it's really on the southern piece of property, there's really no major environmental features except for that little portion of the stream. Um, the surrounding land uses are mainly low density um, residential and agricultural farmland. Um, Stonebridge um, Golf Course, Country Club, and, and development is a little bit to the south. So um, we classify that as medium density. And let me um, turn these aerials off. It'll make it a little bit easier. So you can see there's the Stonebridge um, development. There's some platted areas there, and there, and there. And then uh, there's some approved development that's not been platted yet that kind of wraps up around this way. Um, so that's, that's the Stonebridge um, medium density kind of what we classify that. Um, as far as utilities go, it's kind of a mix in this area. There's, there's some properties that are on well and septic, some that are on water and well, and then there's some that are on county water and sewer. This development is proposed to be um, served by Union County Public Water and Sewer. And again, I know that was one of your big questions last time, and that the developer is going to address that um, in their presentation. <clears throat> Um, before I get the transportation, uh, schools. Uh, we did send this over to Union County Public Schools for some comments. Um, it is in the uh, Parkwood Middle and High School cluster and served by Western Union Elementary School. Um, the Western Union is rated at 67% capacity. Um, Parkwood is 79% and Parkwood High School is 83%. And the school's comments was this proposed subdivision is not expected to present an adverse impact to the enrollment at the above schools. Um, <clears throat> as far as transportation goes, there are no traffic counts in this area, although a TIA was required um, to be done for this development. Um, you, you can see some of the improvements that are outlined in the comprehensive trans transportation plan. Um, and, and these don't have dates associated with them. These are like really long range plans. Uh, Waxhaw Highway 75 is uh, supposed to in the future be a four lane um, road. And then everything else, uh, these are um, two lane roads with a paved shoulder. So they'll be a little bit wider. Uh, again, those don't have dates associated with them. That is far out in, into the future. Um, the improvements that were required as part of the TIA um, the northern entrance, and I'll actually back up so you can see the site plan. Um, the northern entrance um, was going to have a, um, a right in and a left in. The southern entrance was a left in, and there's a three lane section between those two. Um, can everybody kind of picture, visually picture that? So this one had basically a right turn lane in, dedicated right a left dedicated turn lane in, this had a left dedicated turn, and then in between the two, um, a three lane section. So, so basically um, a northbound and a southbound and then a center lane section. So that's what the TIA had required for this. Um, <clears throat> as far as the land use plan, there's a lot going on. Um, you can see that a portion of this falls in the mixed residential a portion of it falls in the single family and a portion of it falls in the employment corridor. Um, this single family um, anticipates a density of approximately one unit per acre um, with slightly higher densities in close proximity to the mixed residential. Um, the mixed residential anticipates um, slightly higher densities in those areas, especially slightly higher than one when it's, when it's close to a single family. And then the employment corridor is a um, really what it is is an employment corridor where we anticipate um, and would support um, business type uses um, to go along Highway 75 because they have good access to, um, to highways. <clears throat> staff's comments, we really haven't changed those. I think you saw those in the, in the uh, staff report. Um, the density is about 2.6 units per acre. Um, since that development or the proposed development is partially within the mixed residential category, um, slightly higher density should be anticipated. 
However, those densities should be tempered by the fact that a portion of the property also lies inside the single family category. Um, while the density of the project should be higher than one unit per acre based on the comprehensive plan, um, 2.6 acres we believe is slightly a little high. Um, we believe a density of closer to two is probably appropriate given the current comp plan. I will remind you that we are also in the process of updating that comprehensive plan. Um, that'll be coming to you later this year. So uh, right now we've got those three scenarios that you're all aware of, but, um, but we are updating it. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> and I want to ask or answer any questions you have. Um, I know that the applicant is here and they do have a presentation to address some of those specific issues um, that the board brought up last time. Yes, sir. Did you, uh, I know that the um, applicant is given a report with public works, but did you get a follow up from them? I did. Yourself? Yes. Yes, they, um, so what had to happen, and, and I'm sure the applicant can go into more detail on this. Um, the, the first time around, um, they submitted what they call a sketch plan, um, and that goes through review, and, and I'm going to simplify this probably a lot. But the, the comment back from Public Works was, we don't know if this pump station can serve your development. And that's, I think that's what you, what, what you all heard at the last meeting. Um, <clears throat> what Public Works asked for them to do was to pay to model the system and to model to see, okay, what can that pump station support? What are some alternatives that can be um, done to help serve this development? So that's what they've done. Okay. And they got a positive answer back from the consultant that the county uses to do those models. And so I, and I got a positive report back um, that a system could be put in place to handle the sewage from this uh, neighborhood. Tyler, to that comment from Robert, <coughs> it, or, you're telling us then that whatever they tie in, therefore it will not affect the people that live in the Stonebridge area. Correct. Now, I'm not, now, now there are some improvements that the developer will have to pay for to either upsize the pump station that's down there or to put a new one in. Thank you. Um, so so there, there are some improvements that the developer have to pay for. So it won't work as it stands today, but if the development was approved, then they would have to bring that up and, and do those improvements. Did you also say that a TIA was required? Yes, sir. But none was done? Yes, it was done. It was, I misunderstood. Yes, yes, the TIA was done and there were certain improvements that, that were required as part of that TIA. And you felt? You and Bjorn felt good about that? Yes, sir. Bjorn gave me a, uh, um, he, he, Bjorn reviews all those TIAs for us, and, um, and I'm, I actually missed one. Um, we had the improvements that I was talking about at the entrances and then the three lane section in the middle. Um, one of the improvements that Bjorn kind of talked about was some striping at the, uh, uh, I think it was like a no, not a no parking zone, but um, basically when the, at the, at the railroad track, um, it's an area just to notify people that hey, there's a railroad track here, <laughs> and don't you know don't go in here when the when the train's coming. Um, so it was a it was a striping section on Rocky River Road. That's on the other side of 75. Yes, though. it is. <clears throat> is the, what's the density <clears throat> on the Stonebridge community? Stonebridge <clears throat> is kind of unique um, in that if you just look at the housing sections it's pretty dense i mean you can see this section right here i mean those those houses are packed in there um and those are I mean, those are you can see that acreage it's 0.17 acres it's a pretty small lot but um stonebridge was approved under an old um union county ordinance that was called uh, smart growth and it allowed a density bonus um, if certain amenities were provided within the neighborhood. And the density bonus was 25%. Um, the zoning out here is RA40, so the zoning category hasn't changed. As you can see, it's RA40. Um, the golf course under that old smart growth section actually counted as common open space in the development. So that golf course can't be it can't be turned into houses. It's going to be a golf course or something, it, maybe a park. I don't know. 
Um, but so is this like cluster zoning kind of? Sort like of, yeah. Yes, so, sort of, but, but you got some extra density because of some, uh, because of amenities. So um, what does that equate to when it's all? Yes, 1.25. So they got a 25% density bonus. So it's about 1.25 units per acre. Um, again, that's when you include the golf course and you know the common area, the floodplain. So that's when you look at the gross density of that entire stone bridge. It's about 1.25 units. The housing area down there by Plum Creek, is that the true homes that are down there? Um, the light's kind of making a weird reflection. Where's no, no, it's back uh, over on the right there where you got the red square on that dot. Oh, yes. Um, this area, I forgot what phase this was, but this section was, I think, what, the second one built in Stonebridge. And yes, these are, I think, these are True Homes, and I know True Homes built and maybe one other section out here. Can you go to the uh, environmental map? Yes, sir. Real quick. So there's a creek that runs through this. Yes, you can see. It goes, it goes under the road? Yes. Okay. So looking at the plans, they're gonna put in two retention ponds and that is that gonna feed into the retention ponds? Or that, what are they gonna do with that? Let me go back to the plan real quick and see what you're talking about. So there's a there's a BMP here. On the so, bottom, if you're, you're down talking about the these bottom, down here? These two, because yeah. that's where the creek comes in here. Right. Yeah, so so these will, and, and these are honestly, most of the time, and I, I'll let the, the applicant um, verify this, but the vast majority of times when, when these uh, conceptual plans come in, these BMPs that are shown on the plans are are big. They're they're really the BMP probably won't be this large. Um, we require two and twenty five. Um, so the, we required them to detain the two year and the twenty five year storm. Um, it, that's likely not going to be that large if, if, if the development's approved. Uh, but but yes, it will discharge back into that stream. So the stream's going that way. Yes, it's going. To, to my right, and yeah, to your right. <laughs> yeah, because these are the kind of the headwaters, if you will, and these all feed that stream, and it eventually. Um, and there's no there's no floodplain on this stream. It's not. It doesn't drain a large enough area yet. I think you have to drain it one square mile before that turns into a FEMA designated floodplain. Um, so this is kind of headwaters of that stream. I just don't want to turn into a Highlands at Optimus Park. Oh, I understand. Yeah. Yes. I wondered if uh, internally, if uh, the increased amount of people on the roadways was going to impact the intersection at 75 and Rocky River, perhaps roundabout, that sort of thing. Has that been discussed internally with staff? Um, it was that that was looked at as part of the TIA, and okay. I think I think DO, DOT was comfortable with with this development. They they did like I said they had some requirements at the at the entrances, right. um, but as you know this is a pretty it's a pretty rural area right now. Um, so there's I mean there's traffic. Don't get me wrong. I mean it's there's Highway 75 and there's Rocky River Road. So there is a good bit of traffic, but it's still it's still rural. It's not it's not like this is in Weddington or Wesley Chapel. Um, but as, as development continues, you will, you know, if development keeps happening in this area, you will get more traffic. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Any more questions for Lee? Okay. Sure. Thank you, Lee. Appreciate your good report. Sure. The thoroughness of your information. Like I said, the developer um, is here. I think they do. Well, I know they have a presentation um, that addresses those previous concerns. If the developer would like to come forward to uh, describe the rezoning request and present information in support of this, we'll accept that. 
you would please uh, give us your name and your address. First of all, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me with this on. Okay, thank you. My name is Sarah Shirley. I'm with American Engineering, and I'm representing Mr. D.A. Davis here tonight for the development. A uh, couple things I just wanted to clarify real quick because they were questions that came up as part of the staff report. Um, we had a wetlands delineation plan done for this site. So the streams that are shown on the GIS map are not accurate. They're not actually there on site. Uh, the wetlands delineation was done by Carolina Wetlands Services uh, back last year. So the only uh, little bit of environmental feature on the site is the wetlands that's shown uh, at the southeast corner of our property. And I'll point it out when we get to the con concept plan. Um, so we, we are not impacting any environmental fe features as part of this plan. The, the TIA was performed after the roundabout was installed, and that was taken into account with the traffic counts. To give you a little bit of background, when Lee says there were no traffic counts on the road surrounding it, NCDOT does not start counting traffic counts until a road hits 4,000 average vehicle daily trips per day. South Rocky River Road just crossed that threshold back in like 2018. So it's only been within the last couple of years that it's even started to count on the NCDOT maps. Um, old Waxall Monroe Highway, for instance, still doesn't have enough counts to be counted on an annual basis. Uh, as other, another part of the TIA that um, we are agreeing to, because we're agreeing to all of the require, or requested improvements from NCDOT, and Bjorn's additional comments. He had some additional comments. So we're agreeing to everything that was recommended as part of the TIA. Uh, we'll be installing a sidewalk along the length of South Rocky River Road uh, along the frontage of our property. So um, just to give you a refresher, since it's been a couple months since we've seen you, thank you for giving us a chance to come back again. We've made a lot of improvements and addressed a lot of the county concerns and questions about the project. We're committed to building a quality development and neighborhood out here. We really are excited about this location. Uh, we think it has a lot to offer. It's a seven minute drive to Waxhaw. It's a five minute drive to Monroe. It's perfectly situated between both towns. As part of this, um, one Did you say a seven minute drive to Waxhaw? Yes, yes sir. What are you driving, an Indy 500 car? No, no, I was driving 57 <laughs> miles per hour. I timed it again tonight just to double check. I, 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 I abide by the speed limit because I have a four-year-old at home and I like to go home to her at night. I understand. <laughs> so a couple of things I just wanted to point out um, from the current staff report. We had previously shown an access to old Waxhaw Monroe Road. That was eliminated based on conversations with the fire marshal. Um, so we've eliminated that. All of the side yards are 10 feet, again, to comply with fire marshal requirements to make sure that there's enough room between the homes to get uh, a vehicle or hoses back there. And then um, number three, uh, we basically obtained sketch plan conditional approval, which included that sewer modeling that Lee was uh, talking about earlier. Um, here's where the existing wetlands are shown. We've got a little patch here, and then we've got a little isolated patch here and here. These ponds are not considered what they call jurisdictional features, meaning they don't have um, significant drainage that comes to them. Most likely they were old cattle ponds, essentially, that just ended up remaining. Couple of things, we have been having conversations with NCDOT and the county, um, both Bjorn and the fire marshal, Kevin Rigoli. Uh, we confirmed with NCDOT, if we were to uh, allow Orange Street parking, they want us to abide by what's called the residential collector road section, cross section, which is a 50 foot right away. So this would be ample enough space to allow for cars to park on the street as well as maintaining a clear pathway for fire and emergency vehicles to get through. The fire marshal only requires that 20 feet of clear road width for emergency vehicles is provided, and we're committing to that. We obtained the public work sketch plan conditional approval. 
they gave us two alternatives. Both, basically, the, there's not, there's a negligible difference between both of these alternatives. Um, one just has a longer length of force main attached to it. Um, the alternative one is the one that we would propose to abide by, and that would run a force main from the southern end of our property that would connect to that existing pump station. As part of that, we would upgrade the pump station to accommodate, uh, I don't know if the numbers will mean too much, but right now it can handle 0.29 million gallons per day. We would upgrade it so that it could handle 0.5 million gallons per day. Um, so, oh, I'm so sorry. Quick question for yes. you regarding the sewer. I understand uh, the developer pays for the improvements. Yes. Who pays for the maintenance uh, moving forward on any, I know those pump stations, you tend to have pumps fail and there's significant costs with maintenance of a pump anytime you have to lift sewer. I think the Public Works Department could answer that more correctly than I will, but the understanding that I have is the developer would pay out of pocket for all of the um, infrastructure improvements built to Union County Public Works standards. So once it's built to the standards, it would get turned over to the county for maintenance. Um, much like roads work with NCDOT, as long as you build them according to their standards, they're accepted into the state system. Thank you. What about the water pressure out there? Water pressure. I'm sorry. Who was uh, that? That was me. I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> really, I didn't see you raise your hand. Um, what we'll do as part of that, uh, Public Works studied that as part of the um, uh, sketch plan approval. I don't know what the numbers were, but what happens is at part, at time of um, construction plan design, we'll go out and run extra. We'll take fire flow counts, do hydrant tests, things like that, and make sure there's ample pressure. Um, if at that time it was determined that there was something that needed to get improved, we would uh, agree to those improvements. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> now your turn. <laughs> uh, you, you proposed to come up with another uh, 0 0.21 uh, uh, million gallons of, of mm -hmm. sewer treatment. Uh, what, what is the amount of, of, of uh, treatable water that, that the development plans to emit, emit? And how do you figure what, what it's going to be? Um, so basically, that's in the sewer modeling report. Uh, smarter people than I have come up with the numbers for that. Um, but essentially, in their conclusions, um, what they basically say is that, yes, if you have, if this development comes online currently, um, the system wouldn't handle it, but if you did these improvements, it handles it. Um, so as to exact numbers, I would have to look back through the report, but I will gladly hand you a copy of the report if you would like to see. Well, I was hoping that you might kind of get an idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because uh, it's, it's sad to, you know, it sounds like a great amount of water, but I don't know how much water each house the, the produces, nor do I know what that additional amount of sewage is going to come to down, down the road when it comes to a treatment plant as to whether the treatment plant is going to be overwhelmed or not. Right. So uh, the public, so none of the numbers that we come up with are on our own. Public Works tells us this is how much we think you're going to discharge from this house based on the number of bedrooms you have in each house number of fixtures. So we are not allowed, in fact, they corrected us a couple times to make sure that we were using the numbers that they want to make to make sure that the system works. So, right, so, so, so the, the additional capacity that you propose and to pay for is in line with what with, with the, uh, the, the government said, that's how much extra juice to come out of that subdivision. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Absolutely. That's very important. We only have one chance to get this right, and we want to make sure we get it right. So thank you for that question. So in conclusion, um, this, this area of Union County is really interesting, and I think you'll find that out. And it's slated for growth, as evidenced in the comprehensive plan. We're right on that, we're right on that edge of the mixed residential growth and the single family. So we're kind of marrying the both of best worlds. We're proposing a single family detached development that is perfectly situated. The schools are under capacity. Um, the money that's being left on the table right now because of the uh, under capacity schools, the state can handle and 
wants to handle. Um, so there's just money being left on the table for the schools. And also the roadway improvements along Rocky River Road, there isn't a lot of traffic now and the improvements that are required to mitigate the increase are very negligible considering. So all in all, the benefits to the county are providing a greater tax base and filling up the schools that are great schools. Union County is number one in the state and um, we're you know, developing in an area that's really well situated. So with that, I'm here to answer any questions. So, so you're going with the wider streets, correct? Yes, sir. That's what I understood. Mm -hmm. Does that cut into, I, I think we, we brought this up last time, mm -hmm. does that cut into the driveway length? No. No. So did, did that reduce the amount of houses that you had planned to? No, because we previously had 50 foot right away shown. So we were essentially just verifying that NCDOT and the county uh, approved those so what you have shown um, it still allows for uh, sidewalks and still allows for a driveway length outside of the right-of-way that could accommodate two cars outside of the right-of-way thank you mm -hmm. yes sir so given the water and sewer calculations obviously you have an idea of what the average square footage bedrooms bathrooms especially bathrooms um, I guess for for the water and sewer consumption. Mm -hmm. um, what are we looking to average as far as bedrooms and square footage? And what is the developer targeting here? Um, at last count, we were averaging 2,400 to about 4,000 square foot. Of course, it's all subject to change at time of market conditions, but that was, that was kind of the target range. And um, is it price points you're asking for? Yes, ma'am. Anywhere from 275 to 400. And Thank again, you. could be lower or higher based Un on understood market <laughs> conditions and <laughs> the uncertain economy right now. But that essentially translates to three or four bedrooms. Thank you. Thank you. How many bedrooms is that then? About three or four. Three or four bedrooms? Yeah. There might be some five bedrooms thrown in there, but three to four. And what is the average lot size? Uh, average lot size, these are all 60 foot by 135 feet, so about 8,000 square feet. Um, of course, you get little, a little bit bigger mm -hmm. lots around cul-de-sacs. So. Right. Okay. Is the only usable common area in this place that got, got uh, green uh, way with, with rub under number two? Uh, you, you had ponds, but you can't swim in the pond. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, there's no walking trails that I can see. So, no parks. Well, so what we're actually what we're proposing are um, there's this black dash line, yeah. that would be a trail system that would go around the BMPs, um, and through the power easement. Um, it's it's kind of nice. This power easement um, we have a little bit of a buffer shown between it too, so that we can provide some vegetation back there. Um, Union Power. Uh, seems very uh, easy to work with. I've talked to their reviewer um, who's, they're basically open to working with us in, in terms of, of landscaping and, and elements within their easement. Um, but we do have proposed um, a clubhouse and pool that overlooks the existing pond. So that would be our large central amenity for the, for the neighborhood. So on, on this, it says there were five feet side yards. It went to 10 feet now? Correct. And that was due to the fire marshal? That was due to fire marshal. Mm -hmm. And that still didn't reduce the amount of houses, huh? Uh, well, previous, so this, the plan that was prior to this one, which was updated for the February planning board, it showed a mixture of 50 foot wide lots and 60 foot wide lots. So we did reduce the number of lots because we're showing now all 60 foot wide lots. So we originally had 309 and we reduced it to 296 to accommodate. Refresh my memory, Sarah, yes. from the number of houses you uh, will have in this subdivision. The total that we would 
cap it at would be 296. Any other questions from the planning board members? Not right now. Okay, thanks, Sarah. You may be called back up here in a minute. Thank Please. you. Yeah, I wanted to, mm -hmm. I think yes. we talked about this. Um, we did have a request, and I, I meant to touch on this during my staff report, and I apologize. We did have a request from an adjacent property owner up here. Um, I think they were having some issues currently with maybe dirt bikes or people riding along the power line easement for a gate uh, to be placed along the power line easement to prevent people from the neighborhood from walking. It, you know, if the development was approved to prevent people from walking on the property. Um, and I believe you've checked with Union Power and they're okay with, with, with a gate as long as they have access to get in and out. I just wanted you guys to be aware of that. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Okay. Thank you. At this point, uh, we have uh, eight people signed up to voice their opinion about the petition and to set some common rules. Uh, when you come up, please state your name and your address. And if you'll be talking for or against it, because some people did put it down, but some people didn't. And uh, Patrick Harrison over here is going to be timing you and when he gets down to one minute, he's gonna to try to get your attention by one minute. And we ask that you finish so we can uh, get on to all people that wanna speak and have time for discussion, et cetera. If we have to bring the applicant back up to answer any questions, et cetera. So I hope everybody will agree with that. So at this time, I'd like to call Hayden uh, McAteer to the podium. Thank you for being here. No problem. Thank you for having us. Um, Hayden McAteer, 1618 South Rocky River Road. Um, currently still live with my parents in that big, sharp curve um, by the old pond there at the very top of your screen. Um, I did my own research. I have accident reports from the state DOT from 2007 till February of this year. I brought it for the uh, for the meeting that was canceled in March to kind of sum up what's in these 24 pages. Y'all can have a copy if you'd like. I have it here. Uh, there was Were there copies for everybody? No, sir. Unfortunately, I just have one. It was 24 pages long and I didn't want to run our, my mom out. I think she's working from home right now. I can appreciate um, that. All right. Um, there's been 121 accidents, three fatalities. Um, so this road is busy. Regardless of anything, this road is busy, and there's been more accidents since that report was made um, that totaled a BMW that Miss Fran hadn't had 24 hours. Um, so me living in this area, imagining 296 houses with four bedrooms each, eventually all four of those bedrooms are gonna have somebody with a car in it. So you're looking Parkwood math here, you're looking 1,600 cars eventually, somewhere in that. That's a lot for there to be no infrastructure improvement on that road other than just the three lane on the big side of Rocky River right here. And that accident report is just from the Doster Road intersection to the roundabout at Rocky River. That is a less than a mile and a half stretch of road. Um, What's the speed limit on that road at that point? Uh, on that curve that you're around talking. that curve i believe it's 35 but 35. people will go 60 in a heartbeat that's what i was looking at this um 45 55 60. i am not against development if it's done in the correct way the correct way to me living in there would be to make that road more than a two lane or just a three lane in that little section um and I'm going to be honest, I think that the people moving into that would more than likely work in Charlotte because a lot of people are moving into the area because Charlotte is overcrowded. Matthews is overcrowded. We've seen it in Waxhaw. Um, 
So I don't know that they would be helping this county grow other than just living here. Um, I feel like if done the right way, I would be okay with some development in this old farmland, but for there to be 296 houses possibly, uh, 12, 600 car, 1,600 cars on the road in a very short amount of time, I don't think that's the right way to do it. Time's up. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Next, we have Chuck uh, McAteer. Chuck McAteer, 1618 South Rock River Road. Um, I spoke last time, so I said a lot last time. I'm not got, I don't have a lot to say this time. Um, we've got our own info from the DOT. I've been living in that curve for 58 years. I know what's there. I know how they come around there every day, running 60. It used, they could come around there before 45, wreck after wreck after wreck. Now, just today, you can't, you can't go to the mailbox without you know, worrying about, are they coming around the curve? Are they coming around the curve? That's the biggest thing for me, is that, just like Hayden said, that many more cars coming around that curve at 60 miles an hour is just, I don't see, I don't get it, I don't get it. Um, <clears throat> Miss Ham, Ham was back here, um, lost her husband right before the first meeting we had. How many times did he put up that fence? <laughs> Any idea? They ran through his fence so many times, he started putting boulders out there along it, moved it back off the right of way, started putting boulders out there, three, 400 pound boulders to keep them out of his fence. They did it so many times coming around there. It just never, never eased up. And they're still going around there wiping out three times since our last meeting. Last time was a little over a week ago, took out my mailbox and the uh, neighbor's mailbox. So it's not getting any better. Um, we also had a petition. Um, we've got it online, and we can produce that if we need to. It's 120 signatures that are against this development. That's all I got. Thanks. Please, yes. before we go any further, first of all, uh, Hayden, thank you for showing this. I'm going to pass it on. Uh, you can pick this up whenever you get ready to leave. It'll be up with Lee or something like that. Uh, <clears throat> Guys, I, just as an FYI, I added up to page 13 and of the accidents, the 121, that should be right there, 55 of those were alcohol and drug related. You can see why the speed, they're speeding and not abiding by the speed limit. So just a FYI, not that it means anything, just a, so, Bit of trivia. Okay, next, uh, D.A. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Davis, for being here. Thank you. Always a pleasure. I'm D.A. Davis, 3114 Lawyers Road. Uh, there's not much I can add to what Sarah presented. I just want to say we appreciate the opportunity this will be a beautiful, planned community. Um, don't know what we'll do about the traffic out there in that curve. That is a bad curve. I've been around it. I used to live out at Stonebridge. Uh, just have to slow down. Maybe they need to add some signs or something out there. I don't know the answer to that. But anyways, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate the guidance that the staff has helped us with. Other than that, if you got any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Otherwise, thank you much. Any questions for Mr. Uh, Davis? Okay, thank you, thank sir. You. Appreciate your time. Sir, you're down here. Do you need to say anything more? Okay. I'm going to take you off this list then. We just wanted to make sure. Okay. Uh, Jules uh, Rosser? Julius Rosen. Okay. Come on up. My name is Julius Rosen. I live at 4720 Old Waxhaw Monroe Road, uh, which is the road to the back of the development there. Um, you know, it's kind of strange. Last time we were here, I was 
pre-COVID, seems a little bit odd, almost a tragedy that we're standing here tonight talking about. If you could density. move over and speak into Sorry. the uh, speak into high the density microphone. cluster zoning uh, in the middle of a global pandemic, it seems odd to say the very least of it. Um, you know, once again, very much like Hayden, it's not about development. We're Union County, we got a beautiful thing. A lot of people want to come live here. You know, the difference between when you look at Stonebridge versus this, well, you can already see there's another road going to an adjacent property. You know, this is something they want to grow, continue to grow, um, versus Stonebridge. I mean, it is what it is. Golf courts can't go anywhere. Uh, as you've said, I think someone has already pointed out there's already some additional uh, plans that are already planned for Stonebridge golf course itself. Um, that's going to go back into the sewer system we get talking about. Uh, you know, I'm not sure which pump station it is. This is, you know, as you know, sewer systems require more than just one. Uh, there's more down the line. Sure, I'm willing. To, they're willing to pay for the one there to pump their sewer uphill or wherever it might be. But there's additional ones that are also part of this line. You know, we take a look. Water running underneath Rocky River. You know, it's kind of funny to talk about. There's not really wet ones there. Well. There's not until it rains. I was going to ask when you were out there just how bad when, was the water flowing in the Rocky River because I can be the first to tell you. Right now, the road shuts down pretty much any time it rains. Uh, and a lot of that just has to do with bad culverts and everything else along that side of Rocky River. But it is a fact, okay? That water's got to go somewhere. Taxpayers are going to have to pay, put in a larger culvert, you know, another improvement that's going to have to be done so that this developer can sit there and get this number of houses in. I guess my thing is, there's multifamily properties that are available close to it. They just purchased their own property. That's not the taxpayer's problem. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Fran, how do you pronounce your last name, Fran? Frashy. Frashy, okay, thank you. Fran Faraci, 1719 South Rocky River Road. Um, just like everybody else has been saying, you know, we're not against building. We do construction. I do property management. It's, you know, it's the way to go. Um, one thing, uh, what they were saying too about the flooding, we have had issues with the covert pipes. With um, They came the other day after two years. Finally, Mr. Paul Woods from the water company came and fixed one of them that weren't draining across the street, they were draining on me. We have still an issue on the other side that my front garage, every time it rains now, since they've done all the water line repairs and the road actually, where it pitches so it runs down, is actually sinking on our side. So that's an issue with some of that water that's not flowing over there. Um, I talked about um, the school density. Right now, um, it's not maybe an impact, but if you look at it, most of the high school kids do drive. And currently right now on Rocky River Road and most buses are gonna be impacted. We sit three and four kids to a seat on a bus right now that gets picked up. So that, if uh, is transportation gonna get impacted? Um, we're gonna bring more buses in if there's more children. That's another issue. Um, if in 2018 they just started counting the TIA that it went to the 4,000 and we're still considered rural, what is it gonna do in two years? Um, basically, um, could sit, oh, the mobile homes. Um, you were questioning the mobile homes. Most of them, if not all of them, just pay lot rent. So for them to get their 30 day, depending on their leases, 30 day, 60 day notice, pack up to vacate, are they packing up their home? You can pack up their contents, but they can't pack up their home and move it out. So are they gonna get some moving expenses? Are they gonna get anything kicked back to them? You know, a buyout for their home that's gonna be destroyed because they're not gonna be able to move it. Most of them are just too old. Some of them are beautiful. I mean, some of them are beautiful on the inside, but where will they go? The people, that's, that's the people who live issue. there, they don't own the trailers? Most of them, yeah, they, they do. They do own the trailers. So they're just paying lot rent. Just so lot rent, basically, okay. But after a certain amount of years, and I know too with the county, because I manage um, 
um, a land out, uh, a mobile community out in um, Marshville. Once a mobile home is removed, the county's not letting anybody move one back in. So, I mean, it, it's just gonna be an issue for where they're gonna go. Um, I think that's about it. Yep, I think that's it, thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Does any of the members here have any questions for anybody that has spoken so far? Okay. Any final comments, Lee? No, sir. Okay. Um, we'd like to go into discussion right now. So open up the floor to any comments that uh, any of the board members have about this. Concerns, clarification, et cetera. Comments. I'll go ahead and start. Yes, sir. Um, you know, this community is in the middle of essentially cornfields. Um, there's not a town center anywhere close by. Uh, seven minutes, maybe in the evening, to Waxhaw. Um, I know my younger days, I could probably do better than that, but realistically, I, I don't know if, if during regular traffic that would be a possibility. But Waxhaw and Monroe are not really major employment centers either. That's I know uh, Chris Platte is doing a great job with economic development, but I don't think we have an overabundance of jobs and a lack of housing in Union County. So I feel as though this community is the answer to a question that nobody asked. Uh, the density out here is something that would be seen more likely, in my opinion, near a town center, someplace that's more walkable. I don't know where you would walk here. I don't know where you would shop. Um, it just seems like a, a lot out in the middle of nowhere and almost like a wish list. Uh, <coughs> to that point, staff recommends lower density and there is no comparable density in the area as it exists. I realize that the schools are underserved and uh, obviously we are paying for the facilities, but there is a cost per student, there's books, there's meals for a number of people, there's other associate expenses, so your, your costs tend to go per student, not necessarily per school. And I know that's a gray area, but uh, I bring that up because just recently the school board has asked the board of commissioners for another bond referendum, which was a, a subject of much debate and continues to be. So I don't think that we have the coffers exactly overflowing for schools right now and we probably should not continue to add capacity for something that's likely to be a net tax loss for the county when you figure in how many students will be coming from each particular house versus the revenue generated by property taxes. Um, utilities, in my opinion, are the same uh, boat. We've had issues in recent years uh, obviously the water project and there's sewer votes that will be coming up. While the developer will be paying for these upgrades, there is maintenance. These lift stations do have redundant pumps. One fails, it's still gotta go somewhere. And when you upsize these pumps, yes, the developer takes the initial hit, but you do have to maintain, you have to replace these pumps and there's a, a pretty significant um, energy expenditure because you're, you're driving these pumps in the uh, tens if not hundreds of horsepower and that's going to require 480 volts and significant amount of juice for it. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Jonathan. Next. Louie, you go make a comment? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I have uh, two thoughts. Uh, number one, the, the, uh, the traffic, one, one in favor of one kind or not, the traffic report Sounds to me like somebody's got to talk to Eddie Cathy and tell him, hey, you get, get some patrol cars out there. There's a little too much drinking, a little too much driving, and a little too much speeding on there. That's the way to control it. Uh, you, know, you, 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 can't, you can't get the name and address of everybody who passes over there and, you know, 
and then and go to their house and talk to them or anything. So that, that, that's something that's got to be done. Another concern that I have, similar to, similar to yours, Jonathan, uh, the, the, the ratio of, uh, of uh, uh, taxpayers uh, of, of, of residential against commercial and industrial, I think we have something like 83 to 17. Uh, a, a, a happier thing would be somewhere around 65, 35. We have, we have houses, 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 and the big, ta the, the big taxpayer we're supposed to have who can't vote is, is the industry, the guy who's got the little manufacturing operation, the distribution warehouse, the assembly plant, whatever it's gonna be. And I, I, I've spoken to some developers who, of course, have been before us before, and I, and I made the suggestion, and, we, and we, we might want to consider doing it. I said, you know, I said, if you came before me and you said, hey, we, 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 we got this 100 acre tract here, it's not good for development, but we, we, have, we have an option to buy it, and in order to buy it, we have to petition to have it known that it's only industrial or commercial or something. I said, then the, 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 the board may be prone to let you build spots all around it to have people that can work there. Because once you've got that much money in a piece of property, you can't play. You can't play games with it. Uh, there's got to be something we can do here to, to, to go from being a better community to, 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 to being a real a, a, you know, a community of our own people. Everybody who builds these developments, especially when you get way out here. I'm a guy. I'm, I came from from Charlotte, the Starlings, and from Starlings out here. But now my now my my business is here, and my real estate that I that that puts food on my table is here. And Charlotte is is a bad memory. And I'm done with it, but 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 uh, you know I, I've seen I've seen neighbors. I mean they get out, drive right, right into Charlotte, and they come here, they sleep here, they put their kids in school here, and there's another ugly thing that we discussed but can't say here, and and uh, uh, they do it because the taxes are low, uh, and the schools are reasonably good, they got a nice house for less money, but their life and their heart is is in Charlotte. We got to find some way of bringing their heart to this county, and and if you got a job here, it sure is helping to help a lot. So uh, uh, I, I have some concerns about, about con continuing to build a relationship of taxpayers against, against, against industry and commerce that we really need before we get beaten up like New York City on taxes. Uh, and and uh, I, I have a problem with it. Thanks, Thank you. Good comments. Robert? I, I appreciate the the uh, improvements to the pump station and to the, the transportation. The only issues I have is the, these are, in my opinion, <laughs> pretty big houses on uh, small lots. And uh, so they're gonna be jam packed in there. I think the density's a little too high for, like you said, Jonathan, out in the middle of nowhere. So that's, that's, that's my big hold right, right now with that. Thank you. Everett? Uh, I wish the density was reduced. I realize that reduces profitability to the developer, but I wish the density was reduced. Okay. Charlie? I, I, have, I have problems with the density. This is uh, about 108% beyond Stonebridge. It's 160% beyond the R40 that it is already, it's a strong change for that part of the world. And it looks to me like a perfect bedroom community. So I have, I have a lot of trouble with the density. Okay, thank you. Patrick? Sarah, the, the trailer area, are those people gonna be compensated when they have to leave? We originally intended Mr. Craig to be able to be here to answer those questions, the property owner, um, but he is actually sick. So, um, but it is, it's our understanding that he is actually gonna help relocate them and we have up to two months after the close of the property in order to do that. So Sir, comment, I think we were concerned about that and we were hoping we'd have a firm answer tonight. Okay. Good. So you good still point. own that, that property? 
that's that's still owned by somebody else. You're you're waiting to buy that part of the property. Not me personally, but well, yes. <laughs> but the, the developer. Yes, it, it is still under contract. Well, what yes, happens sir. if he decides he doesn't want to sell it now? Um, it's, he wants to keep the people there. I there's very this is kind of like a normal real estate transaction. There would be huge financial implications to back out of the contract now, so I don't see that reasonably happening. So, so basically. In two months, these people have to vacate their homes. They've known that it's happening, and it's our understanding that most of the trailers are actually empty now anyway, so. If, if you want to. Okay. Uh, I just, it seems, sure. it seems weird that people just walk away from their homes. I mean, this is their home. Robert Craig owns the property where the mobile homes are, and we have it under contract. Mr. Robert has 60 days. He wants, he, we gave him in the contract to relocate the mobile homes after we close. So he's, he said he would, was going to re, relocate the mobile homes that were in good condition. I don't know what he's gonna do with the rest of them. But that's the agreement that we have. We do not close on that property until we have it entitled. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Patrick. I guess it's down to me. Uh, I believe the last uh, meeting that we discussed this, I made a comment about the density as every and several others have made up here. Uh, we're being asked to change a comp plan which calls for 2.0 to 2.6. The idea that uh, we've got traffic problems, uh, the 55 alcohol-related wrecks is astounding. Uh, Sarah, please don't be offended when I say this, but uh, from the light at Mineral Springs into Monroe tonight, it took me 15 minutes when I came over for the planning board. Uh, I've never driven it in seven minutes, and I volunteer not only at this board, I volunteer at Atrium Hospital, and I, and I was, maybe was kind of catty about the Indy 500 car, but if, you're, if, if a person makes it, they're not driving 55 miles an hour. And, uh, if you were to call the Union County Sheriff's Department, I have, my name's probably on the 911 call, giving license plate numbers out. Because we don't need to have deaths or accidents. I'm sorry to hear about a brand new Beamer that's been destroyed, but I'm very, very concerned about the density. I believe everybody ought to have the right to do with their property what they want to do, but we've got to look at the, the situations. The other thing that, that are concerns, uh, you look at Western, uh, what is it? Western Elementary? Western, Western Union. Union Elementary. You need to look at the socioeconomic <coughs> status of all the students in there compared to Waxhaw Elementary, compa compared to uh, uh, some of the other elementaries that are in Waxhaw, in Monroe, et cetera. Uh, reason I say this because I know our Rotary Club has spent a lot of money out there because the school board didn't have it and the school parents couldn't afford to buy it. So you've got a situation like that. Uh, how many kids or parents are going to want to put their kids in that elementary school versus going and trying to get them into Union Academy or trucking them into uh, Charlotte to a private school? And so these are some things that I think need to be looked at uh, heavily. So that's all the comments that I've got. And I appreciate everybody being here. So at this point, uh, I would like to ask if there's any more board discussion at all. And I appreciate the frankness of your honest opinion, gut feeling, knowledge, etc., from all of us up here. So hearing that there's no more discussion, I'd like to uh, ask for a motion and a second on what we want to do on this. 
Jonathan? If for no other reason but the density, I make a motion to deny the request. A motion has been made to deny it. Do we have a second? Second. Patrick, thank you. All those in favor, and I'll come back and ask if there's anybody that is for it up here. But with that, uh, I'm gonna call for a vote. We've got a, a motion and a second. All those in favor of denying it, please raise your right hand. Okay, you got the count? Yes, sir, thank you. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Uh, so with that, I believe no one up here was for it, right? No, sir. Okay, all right, good. Uh, so with that, Lee, would you come back up and tell the uh, applicant mm -hmm. the next steps in this because of the dial, uh, which was, it, was unanimous, right? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next step in the process is this, uh, this petition will go to the um, Board of County Commissioners. That will likely be at the first meeting in August. I apologize, I have to get my phone out to look at my calendar. It's the third, thank you. <laughs> so this will likely go to the Board of County Commissioners um, on August the 3rd uh, for a public hearing. That'll be, again, August the 3rd, this room, it'll be six o'clock. If you got a, if uh, everybody got a notice for this meeting, um, you should get a notice for that one as well. And then um, a decision. Normally the board doesn't make a decision on the public hearing night, that, but they can if they suspend their rules. Normally they don't. Uh, but if they follow their normal rules, the decision will be on the 17th, um, and that's a 3 p.m. meeting. Lee, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes, sir. Based on uh, uh, Hayden uh, McAteer's report over here, is there any way to have that made available for the Board of Commissioners? Yes, sir. We'll put that in the packet. Sure. Okay. No problem. Ken, are you going to take that one, or are you going to? Yes. Hayden, do you mind if he takes that? to put that in a, a report to the Board of Commissioners. Okay. Any other comments, Lee? No, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Good job. With that, uh, that ends the uh, official meeting. We've got two other topics which we've got to cover. So with that, uh, I urge everybody that's here tonight it's getting ready to leave to be safe, stay healthy, and drive careful. Okay? Thank you all for being here, and thank you for your time and comments and effort. Thank you all. No problem, man. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. Lee, we have a playing staff report. Yes, sir. I want to give you a brief update on the comp plan process. While I'm loading this, um, I always like to sort of update the board on what the Board of Commissioners does with uh, rezoning requests. And I know that um, Oakton went to the Board of Commissioners um, back in June. Um, that was the one on Providence Road. I think it was like 47 um, duplex townhome t t type units and then some commercial out front. Um, the board turned that one down. Um, and Cuthbertson Road, rezoning request and the um man i'm drawing a blank now oh the uh secure turf thank you um they are both going to the board of commissioners for public hearing on the 13th of this month so that's 
next Monday. Excuse me. Securator was the illegal uh, stamp dump yes, where sir. they were burning. Yes, sir. And that's on what day? The 13th. So oh, ne you? next Monday. Do you like, uh, okay. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? That's a six o'clock meeting. Yeah, they they consi they consolidated both July meetings into one. So it's a six o'clock. Um, and I know last time we had a text amendment request that came um, to, to the board and based on the planning board's recommendation, that's we we're not taking that any further. So that's just that's dead. And with that, I'll get into, I'll try not to take a whole long time because I know folks are probably ready to go home, but um, kind of a brief update, quick update on um, the comp plan process. I know uh, we've got a few folks who are on um, committees and you do a lot of hard work on those. So um, you kind of know where you are, but uh, the rest of the board um, probably doesn't. Um, so right now we are in the scenario um, planning phase. Uh, we have three um, scenarios that um, that the, the uh, committees have identified and that the coordinating committee has signed off on and asked for public input. Um, but uh, let me jump down here. So, um, what is a comprehensive plan? You, you guys know this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but a comprehensive plan really just informs. Um, decision makers on you know where we are now where do we want to go how do we intend to get there and who's going to help us along the way so it's really how do we grow up how do we get from what we are now to what we want to be in the future um, it will define our biggest assets and also our biggest challenges um, it focuses on strengthening uh, the county's economic development efforts one of the big things we heard um, and we've always heard on every comp plan process and you guys talked about it tonight is the imbalance between employment and, and residential and how do we how do we get that back in balance um, to recommend uh, the type and the character um, of development uh, that's appropriate in different parts of the county um, there are some parts of the county where um, employment and higher density residential are absolutely appropriate there are other parts of the county where more suburban style residential is appropriate and there are parts of the county where agricultural agriculture and rural development should dominate um, and we need to decide where those are um, we need a, a comp plan will recommend and prioritize policies projects and resources um, and it determines who our partners are to help us implement those things um, and that includes the municipalities uh, we we want um, and you're going to see in a minute some of these policies that have been identified by the committees and we want the municipalities to play a role in those because some of these are dollars um, and it shouldn't be just Union County out there contributing to um, intersection improvements or, or, or various things like that. So there's a role for the municipalities to play. Um, and then it provides guidance to the county on developing um, and implementing future capital improvements. So where do we need to spend money? Where does the county need to spend money on schools, parks, libraries? Um, all of those government funded facilities where should they be where should they go when should we build them um, so so what is our vision this is the very first thing that that the county sort of looked at when um, or the committees looked at when they were um, developing the comp plan um, we wanted to define a vision that would help guide um, the development of these scenarios and ultimately guide the development of the plan um, I'll, I'll just basically, I'll read this verbatim. Um, Union County in 2050 is a place defined by connections where local governments work together on targeted issues. There are clearly communicated plans for growth and infrastructure improvements and resources are committed to their implementation. Union County is a growing community, community where there is increased capacity to address education, transportation, water, public safety, and other multi-jurisdictional issues high density residential retail and employment options in designated areas convenient accessibility between retail residential and employment land uses complementary development patterns along corridors preserved rural character outside of water and sewer coverage areas recognition and support of agriculture as a key industry and enhanced community connections for arts agritourism and parks and recreation um, this went through a lot of different 
many different iterations of, of development. Um, and, and I know uh, Charlie's on the on the ag committee, and I'm I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm the staff member to that committee. And they did they were really engaged on this on this vision statement, and and one of the ones that was originally adopted by the um, coordinating committee, um, several of the members pointed out, hey, you guys aren't really talking about agriculture. So we actually backed up and got some really good. We had a, some couple. I think Charlie what a couple of good meetings where. We really kind of beat it to death and came up with what I think. You got walloped a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we came up with, with a better vision statement. So um, I know staff really appreciated how engaged um, all the committees were on putting this, this vision statement together. And I think it really does a good job of saying, um, hitting the highlights of what we kind of want to be, where things need to go. It sets a vision for the whole plan. Um, what is the process? You guys have seen this before. It started really in earnest in January. I know back last um, August, um, early September, I think it was late August, we had the, um, the land use retreat where all the towns were invited to talk about um, their, their land use ideas and, and um, their visions for the county, and the board kind of heard all that. Um, but really in, in, in January of this year is when we really kind of earnestly kicked off the development of, of, of this comp plan. We put the committees together. Um, we're in the second phase right now. Again, I was talking about the vision statement. Right now we're in the scenario planning phase. So we're, we're our committees are actively engaged looking at, at three different scenarios. Um, the next phase after that is developing an overall plan that implements whatever that adopted scenario is. Um, likely the scenario won't be one of those three. It'll probably be some combination of those three because there's probably some things in at least two of them that, that people want to kind of move around. And that's, that's, how a plan, that's how a planning process really should work. Um, the final step, once, once the coordinating committee sort of signs off on a scenario that, that they like, um, it will come to you guys. So you guys will review it. Um, I know a couple of you are, are, on, um, are on those committees. I mean, and ultimately it'll go to the Board of County Commissioners for approval. Um, you know, this talks about um, the approval. We're, we're here. So this week, in fact, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, we are having public input se sessions on, um, on the scenarios. Uh, the, uh, Wednesday and Thursday are at night, the one on Friday is um, during the day. Actually, so this is on a different slide, so I, can, I don't need to look at my phone. Um, so after those three community meetings, we'll, we'll get feedback at those community meetings and through um, an online survey that's out right now. Um, I know a lot of you have seen it. A um, few of you have shared it. I know a lot of the committee members have shared it. Some of the county commissioners have shared it. Um, and we really appreciate that. It is getting the word out. Um, we have had a lot of clicks on the survey, but if you could talk to all your friends and neighbors and tell them to please actually take the survey, we would appreciate that too. Uh, people are clicking on it, but there's a lot of information. You have to digest a lot because um, it's, it's a comprehensive plan. Um, so we will have three more community meetings um, later on, November, December time frame to talk about uh, the actual plan uh, that's put together based on the scenario that's selected. And then this will probably be more in the 20, January 2021 time frame. I know it says December here, but it'll probably be more in the January, February 2021 of when it's actually adopted. <clears throat> Why do we update the plan? Uh, I know I've shown you this slide before. We're growing, we're gonna continue to grow. Uh, we got a lot, of new, a lot of new people that are projected to come to Union County. So where do we want that growth to go? Where do we want to put people? And where do we want to have jobs? Um, it gets into the next bullet point. We have an imbalance of jobs and workers due to a lot of residents driving out of the county every day. Um, and you can see this is a map that shows living, kind of a percentage of living and working in, in the county. You can see all these folks, basically from 200 down to uh, 207, a lot of these people are driving out of the county. Most of them are probably going to Mecklenburg. You have some that do go to Stanley. You have some that go to South Carolina, but the vast majority are driving into Mecklenburg County. You have a few. <laughs> um, and then growth, I mean, it, 
<laughs> it impacts uh, a lot of different things, infrastructure, environment, community business, agriculture. Um, schools are kind of lumped in with, with infrastructure and, and the way our committees are set up, but I kind of want to call them out separately because it does have a huge impact on schools. But we all know growth impacts all these things. Um, who's developing this plan? I've talked about these committees. This is kind of the makeup. You've seen this slide before. Um, we've got six different, actually seven different committees. We've got, you know, subcommittees that are agriculture, environmental, developer and business infrastructure, municipal and county planning staff, and citizens. And then there is a overriding coordinating committee that ultimately decides what's in that plan. Um, there's, not, there's not a member of the county and municipal planning staff on that coordinating committee. Um, we, we form this committee just because we, we work with it. We work with the plan every day, so we know we have a lot of issues and we want to hear what the towns are saying so all those town planning staffs are on that committee too so we we talk about stuff and sort of disperse it to the different the other subcommittees and then the coordinating committee makes those ultimate decisions um, so the scenarios um, we have three different scenarios that have different combinations of regulations land use patterns and new programs to help help implement the plan um, and th this, is, this is a slide that's really developed for an in-person um, kind of walkthrough, but um, kind of want people to think about issues when they're reviewing um, the different scenarios. Um, so, m you know, the, the idea of more flexibility uh, versus concentrated areas for high density development, um, allowing commercial development in specific areas, um, versus maintaining a quiet residential atmosphere. So again, you're looking at trade-offs. What, what do you want to put where? And, we, and there's always going to be trade-offs. Um, allowing schools to locate anywhere in unincorporated Union County versus establishing siting requirements. What that means is the idea of schools having some type of standard for like a lot size requirement, being close to a major intersection, um, Union County Public Schools does a great job with, with siting um, facilities. They, they know what they need. They know where to put schools. They have adequate lot sizes. Um, we have a lot of private schools that come in that are, that put things on little bitty lots and parking is an issue and traffic is an issue. And right now we allow schools anywhere. Schools can go in any zoning district. So just this idea of, you know, should there be some kind of siting requirements? Um, additional regulations um, and requirements for new developments to mitigate impacts versus limited regulatory burden. So that trade-off of, um, you know, people being able to do what they want to do on their property versus the impacts that those uses cause to neighbors and, and even people that live far away when, you, when it gets to traffic. Because any development, a development that's built in Wesley Chapel is going to impact traffic in Indian Trail and Weddington as people as you saw in that, that one of those first maps, those people are driving into Charlotte, they're gonna go through those communities. Same thing with stormwater. So how do you balance that? Um, lower county taxes versus increased taxes to pay for transportation, recreation, health issues, uh, development. Um, you know, we, there's some problems and you know, we need to, do we wanna fix those problems? Do we not wanna fix those problems? Or is there some balance in the middle? Um, and I, again, you know, supporting municipal land use uh, planning on periphery versus maintaining uh, land use planning authority in unincorporated areas. The idea of um, trying to balance, um, balance those issues of, you know, municipal wants and needs versus county wants and needs. So, the first scenario, this is the, you, you always have to kind of, one of your scenarios is, is normally, this is where we are, it's the status quo. So this is the existing land use plan, not changing anything. Um, so just to kind of kind of go around these gray areas, these are towns. We kind of put those on there to reflect that we don't control the land use in any of these gray areas. Um, these purple areas that you see along Highway 74, kind of interspersed through here, going down 601 and on 75. Um, those are the employment quarters. You saw that in the rezoning tonight. That was one of those overlays. Um, that's the idea that those employment quarters, they have access to good transportation infrastructure. 
um, such as railways. Again, you have a railway on 75. Um, highways, roads, you know, 601's a, a really good road heading south um, into Lancaster County. Highway 74 is good on the eastern side. Um, a variety of employment uses may be appropriate along those corridors, so we've identified that. Um, the green areas are agriculture areas, which are located in the east, uh, south, and southern portions of the county. Um, they're predominantly agriculture and low density, and this plan would uh, purport to keep those that way. Um, I'll jump over kind of the left side of the map. Um, these kind of red dots that are through here, um, those are commercial nodes, varying sizes. Um, they're different types. Some of them are neighborhood centers, some of them are um, commercial centers, um, and that's based on what's next to them. Is there good transportation next to them? Is it a two-lane road? Um, but they're mainly at key intersections. So these are the commercial areas that were identified in this comprehensive plan. Um, the yellow areas um, are more populated um, areas of the county, mainly your suburban um, areas over on the west, and there's some kind of to the south and kind of to the north. Um, those are, are your more, what we would call single family residential suburban um, areas, um, mainly around one to two units per acre, depending on how close you were to some of these higher density kind of orange areas, whether or not you had access to water and sewer, um, various issues like that. Um, townhouses, other types of multifamily developments are not really supported um, in those single family um, developments or single family areas, I'm sorry. Um, and again, typical density will be around one unit, but it can vary depending on location. It can go up to two um, if, if you're closer to a, a town center. Um, and then the last one are the orange areas. So those are, it's called the mixed residential in the current plan. Um, they're near commercial nodes, major roads, um, and they're intended for a range of, res range of residential land uses. Um, townhouses, um, apartments, higher density developments, um, that's, that's what that area is intended for. <clears throat> so again, this is the existing land use plan scenario. This is the current plan that's in place right now. Um, Again, I won't go over this because I kind of talked about it, but flexible, it's, it's very flexible. Um, it gives people a predictable um, land use pattern. Um, this, this would kind of keep taxes about the same because as far as based on this land use plan, I, I can't speak for you know the board raising taxes for other things, but uh, as far as the land use plan goes, there's no new initiatives or programs that are proposed in this scenario, so this wouldn't necessarily uh, ask for anything new, um, and it continues to support um, our agricultural community. Um, second one is called the management scenario. Um, I know one of our uh, committee members came up with, with the name. Um, again, these gray areas are in municipalities. We wanted to highlight that because um, we don't control the land use or the planning for those areas. Um, the primary things you see that are different on this plan, um, again, you see, you still see the dots. Uh, we, we heard from a lot of committee members and a lot of the public that a lot of the commercial knows there was this idea, we need to balance this or rebalance our residential and commercial and employment land use patterns. So we heard from a lot of people that some of these commercial areas that are in the county should stay in the county. They wanted the county to make those decisions regarding commercial development. Um, on the flip side, you see a lot of these green, kind of light green areas like this one and this one and these over here. Those are areas that were um, identified as transition zones and uh, I think most of the committee members like this idea. These are areas that are completely surrounded by one or more towns. So for example, over here in Waxhaw, most of these are completely surrounded by Waxhaw. This one is actually, I believe, surrounded by three different towns. I think you have uh, Wesley Chapel and Weddington sort of to the south, and then in Indian Trail to, to the north. And our recommendation on these is, um, or not our recommendation, the committee's recommendation is that these should be areas that really should look at 
annexing or talking to these towns about the development because it is in a donut hole. Why is a county making land use decisions in donut holes? Um, and the county would not recommend any increase in density in those areas. Um, and areas specifically like this, our actual recommendation would be um, we would all sit down at the table. So specifically this, we would sit down with Weddington, Wesley Chapel, Indian Trail, and the county would play a part to do a, a joint small area plan to kind of come up with, because you've got Wesley Chapel and Weddington on the south who were relatively similar in, in, in their ideas as far as growth. And you have Indian Trail to the north, which is vastly different. So how does this area, how should it develop? What should it look like? And how do we balance all three of those towns' interests? Um, so we would recommend doing small area plans in some of these, and some of them would just be um, you know, no increase in density. Um, orange areas, again, though that mixed residential, you can see, I'll go back to this one, there's a lot of orange and mixed residential on this map. This one, it is pulled way back. We heard, we heard loud and clear from the committee members and from the public that out in the county um, shouldn't really support high density development. And, but there were a few key places where people supported it, mainly around um, Providence and Newtown, which there's a commercial center right there that you see proposed and in close proximity to that commercial center to kind of do some placemaking, to create something nice, to have a commercial center with maybe some walkable um, neighborhood amenities around that. Um, and then another one at, at Cuthbertson. You've already got a ton of commercial at Cuthbertson, and you've got some higher density residential already there. So the idea was to kind of continue that a little bit. <clears throat> um, other than those areas, there's not really, you don't see any orange on this map. Everything else um, where the orange was is now that single family residential um, could go up to two units per acre, depending on where you are, if there's water and sewer available, um, but primarily about one unit. Um, the dark green, this is the um, low density residential and agricultural area. This, this area is where we want agriculture to continue. We want um, farms to continue operating these areas. And I go up to this map and you can see Along Highway 75, you had a lot of yellow and kind of orange in that area. And here it's been brought way back. Um, again, that was based on hearing that um, high density residential development should not happen in the county with the exception of a few key locations. Um, again, the purple areas, um, we didn't change those. Um, we worked with uh, economic development, talked to them. Um, I know all, I think all the committees heard a presentation from Chris Plate, who did a really good job, and everybody liked the idea of keeping uh, those employment corridors in place. Um, again, it's uh, management scenarios, regulatory in nature. Um, th 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 those are really the implementation strategies, how we go about implementing it. We would implement it through regulations in the ordinance, and no really new no new programs. Um, it would just be, you know, stuff we do in, in the planning department and, and other departments. Um, again, it revises that land use plan. You saw what we have today compared to what that management scenario would do. Um, no new taxes based on what's in this plan. Uh, we're not, no new programs are recommended in the management scenario. Um, you would have some increased stormwater controls. Those would be managed in house. We have stormwater staff right now. Um, that enforces uh, stormwater controls, we would just increase um, some of those controls, increase some of the standards. Um, well inspections, um, one of the big issues that came up, uh, I think at every committee, was the water quality. Um, wells, uh, contaminated wells and things like that. So this would potentially require new homes to have a well inspection, just so a, it's almost a buyer beware, just so the buyer knows when they're buying a house what the water's like coming out of that well. I mean, it could change. Question about that real quick. Sure. Um, I know they do have well inspections right now, but they're not testing water quality. It's, I guess, installation. So it's just like more of just a quality type. It is. It is, yes. Um, 
Um, yeah, th this would be a basically a water quality type test to find out what's actually in that well. Is there arsenic in there? Is there manganese? Are there some of those bad things in that well um, before a certificate, o certificate of occupancy could be issued for that house? Does that and, and there, there are rules in place right now at the state level where we this could be done. Does that potentially open up the county to liability? For example, if you have someone that buys a lot and they have a custom home builder to build on that lot, um, one of the last things they're probably going to do prior to, so say they've, they're building their dream house, they've invested all the money, yep. they set the well when they're about a month out from a CO, got arsenic. There, there are, and, and you'll see in the next scenario that there are ways, even if there's arsenic present in a well or manganese, there are filtration systems that can be put on those wells to correct those issues. Um, Would the county have liability in that? The filtration systems? Yeah. Um, I don't know about liability. I think as long as that test comes back at, at that point in time that that well tests fine, um, that, that we would be okay. Because the building code says you have to have potable water. Um, and that's a way to measure potable water is you do a test. Um, now, those filters have to be replaced. And that's, a, that's an ongoing maintenance issue that that homeowner would have to take on. But they would know that here's the original test. There was, to say it was arsenic, there was arsenic in the well. The developer installs a filtration system that, that mitigates the arsenic, takes the arsenic out. But then the homeowner, just like an air filter or anything else that needs to be replaced, every so often those filters on the well would need to be replaced. Sure, but yeah. there wouldn't be a potential for a scenario where the homeowner could say, come back later to the county, hey, you guys should have to replace my my filters. I It was disclosed, you have a duty to provide clean water to me. You're not gonna see any scenarios like that, are you? No, no, I don't think so, because we would require that before that CO was issued, that that water that was tested be free of, of those contaminants. It's just like building a house. When, when you build a house, the county certifies that this house is built to county building code, but then a homeowner or can, can go in there and make changes. They can build illegal stuff on it. The county, after, after that happens, um, the county is, you know, they've certified at that point in time that this house meets code. So that's, that's kind of what this means. Um, and again, this still, this scenario supports agriculture. So it still leaves in place, um, recognizes that ag is a critical industry, <laughs> um, including uh, one of the big issues that came up at, at one of our last ag meetings was the idea <coughs> or not the idea really the 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 fact that agriculture needs broadband um, internet to operate because a lot of your um, i didn't realize this and but but charlie and, and a lot of the the ag members really shed some light on the fact that a lot of the tractors and and things that are done in the field really need on the fly kind of communications to really do their job. And in the eastern part of the county, because there's not a lot of people that, you know, it's sparsely developed, you know, the companies don't expand broadband out there. So, you know, in this scenario, there would be no money thrown at that, but there would be some advocacy, talking to um, folks at the state who we heard from and talking to some of the industry representatives to try to get um, broadband in those areas. Um, John, again, John, I'm about to say something, Jonathan. You speak of that uh, in the eastern part of the county. They're running that billion-dollar water line from Norwood up to our New Salem area, where they're going to process it. Coming across two farms of ours that they threaten to sue you if you don't sell the right of way, and so you have to get a lawyer. They're going to put a high pressure water line by my house that I can't tap onto, but yet they're going to destroy my front yard. And do you know what I'm told by the water department? Maybe in 15 to 20 years, we'll get y'all water out in that rural area. And right now, we are absolutely being, I've got a good word to use, but we're absolutely being ruined with water lines that we can't get one drop of water out of that. That's the one going in the Indian Trail, isn't it? That's the one that's going in the Indian Trail. We don't have, we don't have it. If you don't think that's not frustrating, 
Wellington. We all have arsenic in our water. We have all these impurities. And you've got water lines running back and forth, and you can't tap on it. I've been upset about that. I've talked to all the county commissioners about that. Very frustrating. You know what you I'm saying, back. Charlie? Can I go back? Can you go back one, one page for a second. The increased stormwater controls. This is all the county stuff? This would be unincorporated, yes. Only unincorporated? Yes, sir. So like when they widen Providence Road, it's all that impervious area now that they're going to be, all the water that's coming. Yeah, so, so a lot of your DOT projects, we don't have control over that anyway. It doesn't matter where it happens. DOT is responsible for the stormwater runoff and and. Even if measures. they come through the unincorporated. It, yeah, yes, even, even if it's in a town. Um, if DOT is doing a road project, they're responsible for all that. Um, this would apply to subdivisions, commercial developments, industrial developments, things like that. So we're talking about increasing um, stormwater rules. And Jonathan, I'll say one more thing since you brought this issue up. I'm not picking on you. They are basing our land values on land in Stanley County. One example is land in Baden. Now, you think that we're getting a fair market share, a fair market price for it? Absolutely not. This is a railroad job by this county. You know how I feel about it. Dude. Dude. Say it, say it. I it's pitiful. It. It's pitiful. I'm disgusted. I am disgusted. For the record, I'm on a well, too. But I, I, they're not doing any taking where I'm at. But I'm in the same boat. If I wanted water put in your name, maybe 20 to 30 years down the road, you get something. Right. So I'm sorry. You no, go you're, ahead with your presentation. No, you're fine. You're just, fine. You needed some comic relief, okay? <laughs> he can drive home without stress now. That's right. I got it out. So the final scenario, again, uh, creative name here, advancement scenario. The, the land use portion of this is exactly the same as, as the management. So we, we heard from, from the committee members that, you know, this land use pattern, the fact that we were um, taking away a lot of the higher density um, development options in the unincorporated part of the county, we, we heard loud and clear that, that that's what they wanted, you know, concentrated at some key locations. Um, really supporting agriculture and um, looking at some of these corridors for um, employment um, opportunities. We, we heard from the committees that that's really what they like. That's what they wanted to see. Uh, so these land use patterns are exactly the same. They're not different. The implementation strategies and how we get there between the two are different. The best way I can describe it is that management scenario is things that, that the county is going to do in-house without asking for any more money or any new programs. The advancement scenario is how we can do things fast, possibly faster, um, more efficiently, but to do that, it costs money. So that's, that's really what this advancement is. Um, again, you see that first sentence there, uses the same land use plan for the management scenario. Um, it, it does include new programs. So this reflects input from the community um, on issues uh, such as safe drinking water, uh, transportation, recreation. Um, and this plan would include a lot of initiatives to support that vision. Um, it, we could increase transportation investments from maybe 100,000, possibly up to $5 million. Um, that would come through um, a quarter cent sales tax. Um, that, that's one of the the options in this scenario, um, creating partnerships with municipalities to build um, new parks, trails, and greenways. Um, and, and, and really those two, um, the, the first one with transportation, that was related. We heard a lot of feedback um, from the public about just the fact that, and we hear it all the time here during rezonings, that, that traffic's terrible, traffic's everywhere, and DOT's out of money. And how can the county and the municipalities help sort of advance some of these smaller projects. And maybe it's not a smaller project. Maybe you use, if it's $5 million, maybe you throw all that $5 million at one project, or you could spread it around. Um, we, have a, we have a pilot program right now 
um, through the critical intersection analysis um, where the commissioners gave um, the county, I think it was $500,000 of, of money to partner with municipalities to allow um, some of those projects that were identified on that critical intersection analysis to score higher um, through DOT. So a lot of times some of that scoring that DOT uses is may, maybe this project's kind of floating down here at, at, at number five or number six on the list and there's just not quite enough money to make it happen. But with the county and one of the towns throwing some money at it, it, it all of a sudden jumps up to one or two and it can go forward. Um, and that's been a really successful program. Uh, we've had several projects that none of them have actually been built yet, but we have, we have committed almost every single dollar uh, that we were allocated to projects across the county, and those were all in partnerships with municipalities. So how does that work in a scenario like Providence Road? I take Providence Road, <laughs> and I'll just make the analogy. It's like you've got a dam that's about to burst. Right. Yeah. And, and to me, this and I could be wrong, but it looks like you're basically investing a small quantity to plug up a tributary temporarily, but meanwhile, the rest of it's going full speed at it. Sure, sure. And, and that's why I said, maybe you could take a big chunk of this and put it all on one project. I mean, those are future, those are future decisions that, that would be made if, if that, you know, if a quarter cent sales tax was, was passed. And, and that money actually became available. Those are future decisions that would have to be made. Does economic um, development have any input on what a sales tax I'm, increase would I missed do? the first part, I'm sorry. Does economic development have any uh, feedback as far as what a sales tax increase would do to their efforts? Yes, that, I mean, that, that is something that we would vet through economic development if this was included in one of the scenarios. Because again, this would have to be voted on this is not just something the commissioners could pass. This would be a referendum. So yes, they, they would. Um, the second bullet point here, again, kind of goes in transportation and sort of recreation. Um, we heard from a lot of folks that they wanted access to um, parks, mainly trails and greenways. They wanted different ways to get around. Um, they wanted to be able to ride their maybe bike or walk from their house to, to the store or go out to eat. So we, we heard that. So, this is, you know, maybe partnerships with municipalities to help build these, these recreation facilities. Um, increase stormwater rules to reduce um, the intensity of, and volume of runoff uh, from new construction. You saw some, some talk about that in the management scenario. This, this could be a little bit more on top of that. Um, mandatory well inspections, again, this goes back to, to, to bad water and, and wells, arsenic issues. Uh, mandatory well inspections for sales of both new and existing homes uh, to inform potential home buyers with the status of the safety of, of, of drinking water. Um, and continue county funded, county funded initiatives to address unsafe wells, including um, short water line extensions and the in house um, water filtration systems. So that's what I was talking about a minute ago with how you would see that in the next scenario. Um, but this would be like a grant program. So that's why in this scenario, it's a county cost. This would be a grant program, maybe a 50-50 match um, for the county being able to say, all right, you've got bad water. We'll, you know, you, you go in half, we'll go in half and, and get you a, a, a filtration system. Because, I mean, the reality is the short water line, like, like you guys are saying, it's going to be a while before a lot of that water gets to some of those rural areas in the county. So what do you do? in the interim. How do you address that? And a water filtration system is a good, actually cheaper way to do it. Um, establish a task force. This came specifically um, from the Environmental Committee. Establish a task force to identify strategies to address litter and then support and advocate for agriculture as a critical industry, including committing resources, meaning um, not just advocacy and talking to people, but dollars um, to help expand broadband internet into those rural areas, to, so to actually to make it make it happen. Um, these are the meetings that I was talking about. Uh, we have one tomorrow night, five to seven, Mineral Springs Volunteer Fire Department. Um, on July 9th from five to seven, we are at the Union County Ag Center, and on July 10th from noon to two will be at the Indian Trail Town Hall. So again, July 8th, that's Wednesday, 
Thursday and Friday. Um, and if, if you're in any community groups um, that might want to hear a presentation from, from one of the county staff members, we are open and willing to come and speak to any community groups. Um, the public's welcome to attend the subcommittee and the coordinating committee meetings. Um, and we're asking people to, uh, you know, sign in. That way we'll continue to communicate with them throughout the entire, um, the entire process. And I will say that we, um, Bjorn presented this last night at um, Marshville. So the Marshville Town Board meeting heard this information last night. Um, we are also doing a series of presentations over the next three weeks. Um, I know we're presenting, I think, Thursday at Mineral Springs. Um, we're presenting to Wesley Chapel, um, the Town Board of Wesley Chapel. We're presenting to the Indian Trail. We're presenting to Waxhaw. And we are presenting to the town of Fairview. Um, I think we tried to um, talk to Weddington, but we had some conflicts with, with the dates. I think all of our staff was was either at one of these meetings or presenting to another town. We just we just didn't have enough staff people to go out and do it. Um, but but we are open if if we have availability to present to towns or to community groups. So I'll throw that out there. Same information will be dis dispensed at every meeting. It will not be different topics at different meetings. I know there'll be some variation, but yes. So this, this exact same information will be presented okay. um, at, at all these meetings. Um, these, are, these PowerPoint slides are actually boards, so they're, they're presentation boards that we had printed out. So the in-person meetings, instead of going through a slideshow, you basically can walk around and see these different boards and we can talk to you about them. Um, the, the vision input, we did the same thing. Um, we had three in-person meetings. Um, attendance was okay um, at, at those that was right at the beginning of the COVID um, um, issue. So I think that some kind of detracted from people coming out to that. But, um, but this same information is online. And the online, I don't know if, if anybody has looked at it or taken the survey or not, um, but the online information is, is pretty detailed. So you need to, if you want to take a survey or, or you send it out or you post it on your Facebook page, you know, let people know that it is a, it is a commitment. It's not, it's not a five minute survey. Um, you really need to look at it, go through it, think about it, try to compare those scenarios. Um, I sort of blushed over it here and didn't go into a whole lot of depth, but this, the survey has a link to um, a spreadsheet that you can, we've got a link where you can kind of enhance it, make it bigger, and you can kind of go through that Excel spreadsheet and see a lot of the programs that I was talking about in that advancement, or do we call it advancement? Yeah, advancement scenario. Um, but it goes into a lot of depth on a lot of those. What's the website? I'm sorry? What's the website? Um, hang on a second. So on your desktop, We actually have a dedicated page on the planning department for the Union County 2050 comp plan. So if you click there, um, very first link you come to, you can see we've, that's the very, that's the very first place you land. You splash down at the scenario feedback. If you click this link, there's a nice video that Archie Morgan, who's the chair of our co coordinating committee did. Um, so he talks about what kind of the the different scenarios and it gives a kind of a quick overview and then you just click through so you have um, the existing plan so you can read about the existing plan you can click on sort of these areas read a little bit about it um, click on the management scenario again this is the, the land use portion um, the advancement scenario and then on this one you can compare the scenarios and this is what I was talking about you click there it kind of brings up a larger version so you can see all these issues and strategies that were identified by the coordinating committees. Um, these are the, the issues in the left-hand column, column um, the strategy, kind of a short explanation about what that is, and then you know how it's addressed in each scenario. So some of them is not addressed at all. Some of them is kind of medium. You know the advancement scenario. It's usually high to medium on most of them, um, and then. Some, some tax and, and fee implications. Um, 
So we we tried to throw we, we tried to throw some numbers out there, and we, we did we did a fair amount of research on this. Uh, we talked to some other municipalities, some other communities that had dealt with these issues. Um, so we we didn't want to because because I, I I think you know a lot of people when you say when you say we want parks and recreation, and I don't want to single that out because I I personally like parks and recreation, but um, when when you say that people say oh yeah yeah, yeah I like parks, but parks cost a lot of money. <laughs> Um, they cost a lot of money to build. They cost a lot of money to maintain. So we want folks to know some costs, that there are costs that come with some of these things. Um, so far, we've had about 40-some-odd responses um, to the survey. Um, so we're moving right along. And that survey is open till the end of the month. So again, please go and take it, share it with all your friends. And neighbors and have them share it with their friends and neighbors. Does anybody have any questions? I think I probably took too long. Everybody's tired. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else. Thanks, Lee. We appreciate it. Any other comments here? Robert? Louie? No, sir. Everett? Charlie? Patrick? I have none. Jonathan? Yes, sir. Motion to adjourn. No move. Second. Patrick, thank you. We're officially adjourned at 9.04.